Welcome to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka from our studios here in London. Over the next half an hour, we'll be looking beyond the business headlines by giving you in-depth perspective on the stories that are affecting all of us. Coming up on today's show, the digitalization of agriculture in Africa is evolving and attracting millions of dollars worth of investment. I'll be speaking with Rose Goslinga in Nairobi, Kenya. She's the CEO and co-founder of Pula, an insure tech startup that specializes in digital insurance for smallholder farmers across the continent. And Cecil Ramanotzi, the CEO of Escon Development Foundation, will be joining me from Johannesburg to discuss the company's business investment competition. The program aims to boost the platform of small to medium-sized businesses across South Africa. Then later, I'll be giving you the lowdown on the biggest company headlines of the week. But first, let's start the programme with news from here in the UK. Earlier this week, Health Secretary Matt Hancock announced that tighter border controls will come into effect on Monday in the country due to the risk of new variants on which vaccines may not work. Travellers caught violating restrictions could face a heavy fine of up to £10,000 and 10 years in prison. From Monday, all international arrivals, whether under home quarantine or hotel quarantine, will be required by law to take further PCR tests on day two and day eight of that quarantine. Passengers will have to book these tests through our online portal before they travel. Anyone planning to travel to the UK from Monday needs to book these tests and the online portal will go live on Thursday. If either of these post-arrival tests comes back positive, they'll have to quarantine for a further 10 days from the date of the test and will of course be offered any NHS treatment that's necessary. Any positive result will automatically undergo genomic sequencing to confirm whether they have a variant of concern. Passenger carriers will have a duty in law to make sure that passengers have signed up for these new arrangements before they travel and will be fined if they don't. And we'll be putting in place tough fines for people who don't comply. This includes a £1,000 penalty for any international arrival who fails to take a mandatory test, a £2,000 penalty to any international arrival who fails to take the second mandatory test, as well as automatically extending their quarantine period to 14 days. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by our business correspondent, Simon Pusey. Simon, so it seems that anybody thinking of coming into the UK for the foreseeable future should think again, right? Yeah, well, there's 33 countries that are on this red list, and these are the ones which you're going to have to quarantine for 10 days uh, in a hotel room that the government have provided, but you will have to pay around £1,700 to do that. Um, and there are some pretty serious fines and penalties if you don't. For example, the government has spent the last few days defending this 10-year maximum tariff if you're caught lying about where you've gone on holiday or, or trying to get out of this quarantine. Um, they've come in for some criticism, a former Supreme Court judge saying, you know, you don't get 10 years for various sexual crimes or violent crimes, and this isn't really living in reality and that no judge is actually going to pass this out. Grant, Grant Shapps, the Transport Secretary, saying that this um, reflects, you know, the sort of British attitude in terms of people, you know, that there should be serious, serious penalties for people that, that don't do this. Um, so failing to quarantine in a hotel from one of these red, red list countries um, will, will carry a fine also between £5,000 and £10,000. Pounds. Um, and if we just go through, there are 33 countries on this list. South Africa is an obvious one because of the new variant, but there's also, um, you know, places like Brazil, Portugal, um, sort of, we get quite a few tourists coming from those countries. Um, the Scottish government says it will go further and says that everyone um, arriving from by air will have to quarantine for 10 days, so not from a set number of countries, but anyone coming internationally by air. Um, and then if you look ahead, we're all sort of hoping the summer is just around the corner because it's so cold here at the moment. But um, Grant Chaps again saying that no one should really be thinking about summer holidays, you know, abroad, um, but home as well, which um, I think is sort of... Uh, depressing a few people because that's obviously the sort of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, he said that the UK has been talking to other countries about setting up an international system for checking if people, um, you know, have, have been tested and tested negative. Um, there will be more information on the 22nd of February when Boris Johnson's going to lay out a kind of road map. Um, and that, I think, is the sort of light at the end of the tunnel or the, the only positive thing that we can see at the moment because that's going to be a road map out of lockdown about how we're going to get out of this. So that's the 22nd of February, which is, what, two weeks' time or so. So I think a lot of people are looking for that for some good news. Yes, some good news finally, even if it is in a couple of months. Thank you, Simon. Thank you.
Here's some other business news from across the globe. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu appeared in court earlier this week and pleaded not guilty to corruption charges. Netanyahu is accused of bribery, breach of trust and fraud. There are allegations of gifts from millionaire friends and that he sought regulatory favours for media tycoons in return for favourable coverage in the press. He's called his prosecution a political witch hunt. Israel's fourth election in less than two years is due to be held on March the 23rd. The EU is said to be considering laws that would force tech giants to pay for news content, mirroring similar moves in Australia. The bloc is currently drafting two new laws designed to stamp out harmful material and curb big tech's power. MEPs have said the reforms could be amended to include rules requiring platforms to share some of their revenue with publishers. Tech titans have stepped up efforts to ink licensing deals with publishers in a bid to avoid the threat of regulation. The Cuban government has announced that it will allow private businesses to operate in most sectors of the country. This is the biggest reform to its state-controlled economy for years. Private activity was previously limited to a list of sectors set by the state. The list of authorised industries has now been expanded from 127 to more than 2,000. Now over to our next topic. Pula is an insure tech startup that specialises in digital insurance for smallholder farmers across the continent. The company assists farmers in emerging markets by enabling them to manage their risks with insurance and digital solutions. Pula has recently closed a Series A investment of $6 million led by Pan-African early stage venture capital firm TLCom Capital with participation from non-profit Women's World Banking. Rose Galinga is the co-founder and CEO of Pula. She joins me now from Nairobi, Kenya. Rose Goslinga, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global and congratulations, congratulations because you've just uh, gone through a, a round of investment which was successful. Six million dollars has been pumped into Pula. How has this changed and how is it likely to enhance your aspirations uh, for the company over the next couple of months? Well, look, like um, raising a Series A is definitely a milestone for the business. And for sure, it, it reflects where the business has come from. I, I remember when it was just us, me and my co-founder bootstrapping. And now, you know, we employ 55 people across and with the Series A. Um, before this, we were working across 13 countries in Africa, everywhere from Senegal all the way to Madagascar. But what we realized is that our product isn't just fit for African farmers, um, it also has potential for Asian smallholders as well as Latin American smallholder farmers. So we really found that, you know, solutions that have been built in a Nigerian, you know, um, um, or a Madagasi context really also work for them. So what's really changing now is that our product, we're taking it global. Like we were, you know, we're talking to people um, everywhere from Indonesia to Cuba, for that matter. So it's 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 really kind of bringing that you know um, global perspective to the business, and I really like that. I think it's it's not often that an African business can actually go and provide a solution for any location in the world. Absolutely, um, it's it's wonderful, and especially because you're protecting small farmers. You know, in Nigeria, that's a massive topic of conversation at the moment. I know you're in Nairobi, but you may have picked up on that. Uh, but climate risk is a significant part of um, mm -hmm. one of your services. We mm -hmm. talk about it a lot in um, the global north, the UK, for example, they're going to be um, hosting COP26 soon. Mm -hmm. How significant is the climate emergency, do you think, in Africa? Um, and are you seeing that this is one of your main payouts when it comes to insurance? Absolutely, absolutely. Like our, we pride ourselves in that our product is very simple, but it's comprehensive. So at the same time, you know, for example, let's take a country like Nigeria. Um, we always knew that flood was a big, big risk for farmers across the country. But this year, we actually saw something that we hadn't seen in the last, I would say, 15, 20 years, where we had floods in the north, but drought in the south and west of parts of the country. So having those kind of two risks happen at the same time, or that at like a huge, a pretty huge scale, that's kind of, you know, those are kind of risks that you're seeing now more frequently across all the different markets that we're working in. You know, so whether it's, you know, two events that you usually wouldn't see at the same time happening in a country like Nigeria to, you know, seeing things like locusts, things that we always used to think about as like biblical plagues. We have had locusts for the last two years in Kenya. So, you know, our product from that perspective is very relevant to farmers and very relevant to the organizations that serve them, whether it's governments, 
um, banks, international NGOs, those are the kind of customers that end up buying our product and then say, look, we know that farmers need protection. We know that the risks are just increasing. What is it, uh, Rose, about um, small uh, farmers in Africa that just don't get, they just don't get the respect, they don't get uh, the investment, the infrastructure that's needed in comparison to what you see in Britain, for example, where farmers are subsidised, they're supported, you know, if the cattle needs to be cold, they're compensated. Have you found that when you are speaking uh, to uh, some organisations or donors for help, that you know the, the the support is just not there, and is it changing? Definitely, uh, we definitely see that also across um, African governments. Um, you know, it might not be the first people that you think about, but we actually, you know, in Nigeria, we work together with the Central Bank, with the Ministry of Agriculture, and we really see that there's a very much a changing narrative around that. We partnered very early on. One of our supporters was the Africa, uh, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, and they really kind of, you know, they've really been kind of changing this narrative with governments, with international donors that. You know, smallholder farmers are your voting base. You should listen to them. You know, like these are the people who make up, you know, the, who, who put you in power to some extent, and you need to support them in their needs. Like, you know, providing seeds on loan to them. Uh, the Nigerian government does a lot of that. And we've really seen that change in the last, you know, five years or so, I would say. Like when I started coming to Nigeria, every, you know, things were kind of shifting around oil, but that's that narrative has absolutely shifted also with this government. And we see that that's something that's, you know, farmers are more and more becoming, you know, a serious voice in policy, a serious voice in in these kind of markets. And while they difficulties often that it's, you know, they could be easily dismissed. You know, might not know what happened in, you know, in Bauchi. You might just not know. You know, it's 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 not that that guy is going to knock on your door in Abuja. So it's easy to dismiss them because it's not just on your doorstep. Uh, we often find that if it's raining in Lagos, people say, oh, we need flood insurance. Um, <laughs> but that's, you know, like we don't insure any farmers in Lagos, like, yes. you know, more likely in Sokoto, you know. Yes, um, yes. So it's, it's often just distance. It's like, you know, it's it's it can be if it's not happening to yourself immediately, that can feel like very far away. And decision makers aren't often farmers. So, you know, there's there's definitely some distance in there. Like yeah. What's made us really kind of successful is really using technology that way because like if your if your agent up in you know jigawa has 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 a tablet and can input that data real time then we can see it you know then our partners can see it they can see hey um there was a flood there we can see that and it, like that transparency uh, that technology that immediacy that technology brings that's really kind of the game changer there and then you just add like people like i think one of the most powerful things there is that we often like we like to rely on automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning. And we certainly as a business, we've d done all of that. But the most powerful resource that we still have is people. And like, you know, particularly in Nigeria, there's so much, you know, like we work with a lot of like more like several hundred field agents on the ground, like when it's harvest season and the information that you get from those people and immediately now enabled through technology, that's where you get really good products and you, you can really provide a really good service to customers. Absolutely. We'd definitely like to see more expansion of Pula in Nigeria. You know that country all too well. You named more states than I could, um, Rose. Just lastly, how were you able to kind of cut through some of this red tape and bureaucracy that you get with some of these established institutions like the banks? You've mentioned uh, the central bank in Nigeria because, you know, there is a lot of fear and there is a lot of brick walls, especially when it comes to um, new initiatives and technology. Um, was that difficult? And are you finding that they are open to you know listen to these new initiatives absolutely i think it's you know like with any any partnership look i i was i'm originally from holland but i grew up in tanzania i've spent most of my life in africa i spent the last five years going to nigeria more times than you know my heart like you know that i can remember like there are more stamps in there um however what you know we find is it's always in the end about relationships and about finding good local partners in nigeria we have we work with over nine insurance companies and companies like Veritas Capital Assurance, like people like Leadway, they've really supported us, like helped open doors for us. Like we would come with a technical capacity, but they come with the relationships. And so building like building successful businesses is about building those relationships and like taking them forward. It's it's not never a one-way street and it's it's, it's a garden that you always have to tend every day. In my Absolutely. Experience. No pun intended. Rose, you'll have to come back and speak to us on the show when the investment does expand into Asia and when you're going for our next uh, round of investment. We'd love to hear more from you. Thank you so much, Rose Goslinger, the CEO and co-founder of Pula. Thank you.
In a moment, I'll be speaking with Cecil Ramanotzi, the CEO of Escon Development Foundation. But before then, here's some company news for you. Tesla announced on Monday that it had bought $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin. The electric car company said it bought the digital currency for more flexibility to further diversify and maximize returns on our cash. Tesla also said it will start accepting payments in Bitcoin in exchange for its products, subject to applicable laws and initially on a limited basis. This will make Tesla the first major automaker to do so. Singapore's state investment company Temeshek Holdings announced Tuesday that Ho Ching will retire from her roles as chief executive and executive director in October. Ho, the wife of Singapore's Prime Minister Li Xian Lung, has been Temeshek's CEO since 2004. She will be succeeded by Dilhan Pillay Sandra Segara, currently CEO of the firm's investment arm Temeshek International. Temeshek is among the world's largest investors. Its portfolio value stood at $230 billion as of March the 31st last year. Ocado has reported a leap in annual sales and core profitability. Best known as an online grocer, but also a provider of robotic warehouse technology, the company was the latest supermarket-style business to confirm a boost from its status as an essential retailer. Its retail business recorded a 35% leap in revenue during the year to 29th of November to just under £2.2 billion, thanks to surging demand for deliveries during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now to our next topic. Escom, once one of the largest producers of electricity in Africa, is giving back to budding entrepreneurs in South Africa at a time when the unemployment rate in the country is at an historic high of over 28%. In an effort to boost enterprise development, the ESCOM Development Foundation is once again running the annual ESCOM Business Investment Competition. The showcase provides a platform for South African owners of SMEs to become part of a community of like-minded entrepreneurs as they look to build on their business's solid foundation and realise their true potential. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by Cecil Ramanotzi. He's the CEO of the ESCOM Development Foundation. Cecil Ramanotzi, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. Of course, we're in the middle of the pandemic. I'm in Britain, you're in South Africa. We seem to be varying pretty bad at the moment, but your business investment competition is still ongoing. Can you kind of tell me how the pandemic has changed uh, your vision for the applicants? Thank you very much. Uh, good day uh, to you and to the viewers out there. Through this uh, business investment competition, having gone through the COVID-19 pandemic, I think it has made us to dig deeper in terms of, uh, it has, one, it has provided an opportunity for us to um, think uh, out, of the, out of the box, uh, dig deeper and look at uh, how technology can be used in implementing this program, by the way. So we have, uh, to a greater extent, uh, we're forced to go back and think in terms of uh, how can we uh, in the midst of this uh, COVID-19, in, in compliance with the, of course, the COVID-19 regulations, how do we continue, continue uh, deploying or implementing this particular program? How do you empower SMEs out there in the uh, in, in in the midst of COVID-19, and where we have an economy which is, uh, of course, have ta has taken a knock globally and locally, by the way, but we need to continue assisting those SMEs and promoting and creating some hope for these small, medium uh, enterprises. The entrepreneurs that are there to make difference, as you may know that uh, globally, uh, the, um, and, uh, the, uh, the entrepreneurs, the small economies are the ones that support the macroeconomy as such. It is, and hence, it is important for us as the ESCOM Development Foundation to keep uh, assisting these uh, upcoming small, medium enterprises, and hence this particular program, by the way. Absolutely, Cecil. You've been going uh, for over 12 years and, uh, you know, thank God you were able uh, to continue. I know the applicants and the application process has closed now. Um, am I right in uh, presuming that it's all tech? Is that what all the SMEs are now kind of uh, going towards? Or are there other, you know, sectors um, that are booming or doing well? Give us a taste of what uh, the, the, the SMEs in South Africa are up to. In this particular program that we do, this business investment program, uh, which is enterprise developing uh, program, 
within our corporate social investment uh, space. Uh, we focus on the sectors that uh, drive, and we align, by the way, with the economic uh, settings of, of the country as such. But we focus on four sectors that contribute largely towards the uh, gross uh, uh, domestic product of the country, or our GDP. And these uh, sectors involve your manufacturing, your trade services, engineering, stroke construction, and as well as agriculture. So those are the four sectors that we focus on in this particular program. As I said earlier on, they do contribute to a large extent, having done our research, they do contribute to a, a significant, significant extent when it comes to GDP. But over the last 12 years, I think we've seen the quality of the entries that are coming through improving year on year, by the way. We have seen these, um, we also do some case studies and we've seen some of these uh, SMEs that have gone through this particular program. Of course, there's prizes to be won here, and there's a total of about, across all of these four sectors, there's about 1.3 million to be shared amongst all of these uh, uh, SMEs that will be finalists, by the way, because we get number of entries across. And as we speak now, you, you can imagine the entries that we'll, we will receive based on the challenges that the small medium enterprises are experiencing in their own uh, uh, setups as uh, the uh, budding entrepreneurs or, or companies or small companies that are trying to make to thrive in this tough economy. So, over the last 12 years, we've seen uh, uh, the quality of uh, enterprise of these uh, entrepreneurs or these SMEs uh, uh, entries coming through. And as well as, uh, as I said, case studies uh, of these, we do some case studies and we've seen how they have, uh, how this particular program has contributed towards their small environment and contribution, the small contribution that we made to them, having made some serious impact, a, a huge impact in their own setups. I mean, some of these, uh, one case study is you have a situation where one of these SMEs has been able to extend his or her a plant, a manufacturing plant, using the prize money that was won from this. But only, not only that, it's a capacity building program and it, it, it culminates into the Business Connect, Connect, Connect which is a platform, it's, a, it's, a, it's got about four topics, by the way, and these topics involve uh, the first one being the, the financial literacy, the next one being speed marketing, and the next one being supply chain, and the last one being um, how do you do in marketing in terms of products and services. Now, in this two-day uh, session, they are able to we bring uh, speakers from different uh, uh, walks of life from a business perspective, those successful uh, who have made it as a young uh, uh, coming or up and coming uh, entrepreneurs. And they've made it into the, what one would call from a second economy into, from third to second economy, to some extent to the first economy where you have your multinationals. So those are some of the entrepreneurs that will come in uh, who have moved into that uh, specific uh, category of economy and uh, uh, sectors and within their own industries have moved into those uh, uh, markets uh, and as well as the uh, uh, revenue uh, uh, caps that they've moved into. So they will be sharing their experiences as entrepreneurs, the uh, ups and downs in terms of their, their experiences in their own uh, lives as entrepreneurs or as uh, business owners, by the way, or companies that they have formed over a number of years. Okay. So um, we, 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 we are of the view that the COVID-19, by the way, has to a greater extent uh, made us to come out of the uh, uh, cocoon, so to say, in terms of uh, uh, think out of the box and appreciate the opportunities that the technology has brought to all of us, by the way. And Absolutely. you'll see that as I spoke to the sectors that are, we are um, focusing on, trade services is where you find a lot of, uh, of course, we expect a, a serious innovation coming out of these SMEs in terms of, a, uh, I mean, a, an example, um, uh, the uh, um, uh, services, uh, I mean, you've got the, the Ubers of this world where the innovative uh, component comes into play. So we expect the number of entries and the entries that are coming through to come up with these uh, 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 innovative ideas. And of course, they'll be judged and 
in as well as... Uh, there will be all of the process and procedures. Cecil Romanotzi, we've run out of time, which is such a shame, but I do know that you've got a networking event coming up in March. You're going to be announcing the winners soon, and uh, we're definitely going to be tracking that on Channels Business Global. So definitely uh, come back onto the programme. Semel Romanotzi, the CEO of ESCOM Development Foundation. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Sadly, that's all we have time for today, but do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye.